It's mid-May, and even though it snowed last night, and it's really pretty cold and wintry in the shop today, summer is coming, and that means campfire cooking season. And what better thing to use over the campfire than a nice little hand-forged skillet? I already have a piece of round plate that's cut. I think this is something that was cut out of a bigger project, and at one point my steel yard had stacks of this kind of stuff. So you might want to look around to see if they have it. It's very nicely cut. I don't have to worry about grinding it to shape this way. It is 8 inches in diameter, or about 200 millimeters diameter, and it's about 12 gauge thick. So it is at about 3 millimeters thick, something like that. Now this will fit in the door of my gas forge, and that's absolutely going to be the easiest way to get the entire thing hot. It's so much easier if it is completely hot when you forge it. The eighth inch material is a little bit heavier than I might normally use. 14 gauge is pretty good. I've done them out of 16 gauge, but that's a little light. And bigger skillets out of eighth inch would be really nice. Now as part of today's video, I am conducting an experiment with some more new camera equipment. I bought a 22 millimeter manual focus, manual aperture lens that's on the little camera that I'm using right now. So I'm trying out some more manual settings, trying to explore that, and I just want to see what it looks like. If this isn't looking very good, you might actually see me on this camera over here, which is the usual Sony Handycam, just in case this one's not getting a good picture. I'm also experimenting with a different microphone. I'm trying out the Rode Go microphone, which is a very small transmitter receiver microphone. The microphone's built into the transmitter. I don't need the cable that I always get hung up on, but just in case, I still have the lavalier mic for the Rodelink wireless lab that's a little bit fancier microphone system, but I have some issues with the cable snagging on things and getting pulled out, and sometimes it causes problems. So we may go back and forth between these a little bit today. Right now we're recording on both of them, and I'll see in editing if one is really good, one is really bad. I can still return the other one if it doesn't work very well. Now to work on this, I'm going to go over the bottom end of an old oxygen cylinder, and I'm going to start by doming it. I don't start by creating a flat bottom. And this is a technique that I learned from Jim Hoffman, who does a lot of colonial reproduction work. You just want to go slowly. Now this has a little flaw on the bottom side of it there, and I wanted to make sure that that's on the outside, not the inside, where it'll make food stick. set up a power hammer to dish these, or a fly press or a hydraulic press. But be careful not to go too far too fast or you end up putting ripples in it. And then you get little cold shuts and they're a real problem to deal with. But the heavier plate does alleviate some of that. getting there. I think we can go a little bit deeper. We're not quite full depth of our form yet. Now at one point I had experimented with a form that actually had a shape for the skillet and you worked the skillet on the outside of the form. It had a big C-clamp type arrangement. You heated the edge up with a torch. You, you bent down a little bit, but that always left little puckers. It left little folds. It was really a lot of work to get that to work. Once Jim showed me this technique, there was no going back to that old form because this is not only faster, easier, results in a better product, but it's one less piece of stuff you got to have laying on the shop floor to trip over. Like so many things, if you just take your time, you'll get there before you know it.
dump the scale out from time to time. There's no reason to forge that in. And ideally, this would be smooth and polished. But they rarely are. I think one more heat and then we'll be good for the dishing. Now as we do this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different microphones. Or I should say I'm going to switch back and forth as we edit between the different microphones. Right now I'm talking on the Rode Go. I just want to see what the sound quality is like, both vocal and does it pick up the forging noise better, worse, is it annoying, or any more so than the other microphone. So now let's switch over to the Rodelink Filmmaker Kit which is my old lav mic and see how it does under the same circumstances. This is almost done. That's pretty good. So this is still the, the road link, the wired lav mic that goes to a transmitter and then goes to the camera. And now let's switch back to the Rode Go, which just goes, has a microphone in the transmitter that goes straight to the camera. So is there really any big difference between the Rode Go? Now back to the Rode Link Wireless, which is a larger, more expensive system. And I have real trouble snagging that microphone cable from time to time, and it's come unplugged a few times. It has caused some real issues on the videos. So now back to the Rode Go. Because it doesn't have a wire, it might solve some of those issues, but it does have the little bigger transmitter here, and the microphone probably isn't quite as high a quality. So we're just getting to see what the difference is between these two microphones. Which one I'll continue the video with, I will decide when I get through with the editing. I've discovered one other advantage of the little Rode Go. I can still get my eye up to the diopter on this camera to check my focus at the anvil. And with that bigger microphone, the transmitter is about this big, it hangs over the back far enough. I can't do that. But back to forging our skillet. Now we want to go ahead and make this flat. Of course, if you wanted a little walk for doing stir-fry, that wouldn't be that big a deal. This puts off a lot of heat, so even in these hot mill gloves, my knuckles will get hot before we're done with this. Just something to be aware of. Now the deeper you sink this, the straighter the sides of your skillet are going to be, and that's just up to what you want in your skillet. So come in here like this and start standing that rim up a little bit more. It's one of these things that as you work one area you'll end up needing to correct another area and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth.
might go back to the cylinder bottom to kind of refine some of that. We have to be careful not to take the flat out that we've now started. We do want to try and get this rim even all the way around. Whether you need a straight-sided skillet or not is really just up to what you see your skillet looking like. It's much easier to get a spatula down in there if it isn't straight-sided. I suppose if I were uh, making skillets by the hundreds, I'd uh, have a fly press die for this or a hydraulic press die. I'd probably just stamp them out in one push. I'm just trying to smooth up the lip. I'm not trying to dish the whole thing back down in here again. working the edge. getting pretty close to where I want it. I'm also looking for any signs that this lip is curled over a little bit and flattening it out. Way easier to forge hot than it is to try and grind the inside of this. Sort of clean up the bottom a little bit more and we're going to be ready for a handle. The first thing is to make sure it looks like it's got an even lip all the way across. Not really going to hurt anything if it doesn't, but it looks better if it does. And then we want to make sure the bottom is good and flat. So I'm going to use the flat side of the rounding hammer here. A round flatter would be nice. 
but you don't want to use anything with real sharp edges that needs dings. The surface is probably rougher than you'd like on a skillet anyways. I think I'm pretty darn happy with that. I think it's time to put a handle on it. Well, I've let our skillet cool and I've cut a piece of quarter by three quarter flat bars. So it's about six millimeter by 20 millimeter flat bar. It's about eight inches long, so the same length as the skillet was. And it's really important when you're making the handle to think about leverage. If you get a really long handle, which is nice to keep your hand away from the flame, it's gonna have enough leverage that it might make the skillet tip. This being a heavier skillet pan that I use sometimes, it's gonna be less likely to do that, so this handle shouldn't overbalance it, but it's something you need to keep in mind. I'm gonna start this by setting about three quarters of an inch off the edge of the anvil and just shouldering in right there. And that's going to be the part that will attach to the skillet. I'm going to take it down to about a half inch here, and then we'll upset this back a little bit. By having that shoulder, I can hook it over the edge of the anvil. It makes it pretty easy to, to work. That's really all I need to do to that right now. I'm going to clean this up a little bit and then we'll spread that. I'm just going to thin that back. I'm going to leave it a little thicker than the original thickness, but not much. Clean that shoulder up a little bit. more symmetrical and even things are before you start spreading the better it'll all spread Kind of round the edges of this over so it's more comfortable. Although you won't hold a skillet down here by this part of the handle, but nevertheless. The next thing I want to do is spread the little end out. This is actually just going to be a place I can get two rivets side by side onto the skillet so it's a good stable handle. And for that I'm just going to go to the cross pin. And you can put a little shoulder on this, but I don't think it needs it. We'll need just a little bit of filing or grinding to clean it up, but that's going to be plenty of support for the skillet. I think I'll switch to some slotted jaw tongs. Then we'll draw out the other end. I just want to continue this taper up, and then I'll offset this, draw a little tail, and make a little curl so you can hang it up if you want to.
you could use a slightly better fitting pair of slotted jaw tongs there. Looks like I don't have a pair that fit better. Let's try these. It pays to have lots of tong choices. I'll let this spread out a little bit. We've done very similar handles several times in the past. Draw this out to a nice square taper, and then we'll round it up. We take our square and forge it to an octagon. Take our octagon and round it up. And I also want to go ahead and heavily chamfer the corners on this as well because this is the part you'll be holding and it really does need to be comfortable. Nothing wrong with coming back and doing a little bit of filing on this. You know, start with just a little curl on the end here. Offset that a little bit. And we can start this here at the anvil, do it over the horn, wherever you're most comfortable making that ring. I'm going to go ahead and put my touch mark on what looks like it ought to be the underside of the handle. I'm going to start this with two center punch marks to drill for the rivets. Now I'm going to drill these for 8 inch rivets. I think that's plenty strong enough for a skillet of this size. Now 
Now, even though I'm going to put this on the outside, it's easier to drill my holes from the inside, so I'm going to mark them on the inside. You can barely see that silver pencil mark. If you're not comfortable with your marking, just do one, drill it, rivet it, and then come back and drill through the, the second hole to do it. But since I want to do this from the mark from the inside and rivet from the outside, I'm doing it this way. Now I'm just going to hand hold this under the drill press, but I know from past experience that I can stop this drill press. The belt slips very easily and I'm not worried about it grabbing and ripping this out of my hand. If you're not that familiar with your equipment, or if you know your equipment is much stronger than you are, find a way to clamp this up or use a hand drill on this. It'll probably be safer. But I'm not worried about it with this drill press. It's one of the little annoying things about it is that it does stop so easily. Eighth inch rivets are light enough you can set them cold. You don't need to heat them up. And I just want to get the first one started. And then I want to put the second rivet in, which I think I just, just knocked on the ground somewhere. There it is. Can't believe I found that on the dirt floor. Now if you look at this, because this isn't curved, it doesn't lay down flat. And if you try and set that rivet just like that, it's going to cause problems. So with the rivet in there, just to make sure things stay up, I'm going to tap that down. Careful not to forge the rivet. And then once that fits the contour, I'll use a little monkey tool to make sure it's really set. Then I can do that rivet. I'm just doing these by hand. I kind of like the handset look on a rivet. If you want a real nice head, go ahead and use a rivet setter. Now that's a functional skillet, but I think we need to put some shape in the handle. To start with, I'm just going to heat it up right here where it transitions. Just give that a little bit of shape. That might be all you really want for your handle. I think I'd like to put a little bit of curve in that though. And for that we'll go to the forge. I just want the handle hot. I don't want to heat up the place that I just riveted. This is just up to your personal aesthetic. I think that's all I want to do to that. Our skillet ended up with about a five and a half inch bottom on it and inch and a half sides. So what is that in metric that's about uh, oh, close to 140 millimeters around with a flat section on the bottom and about 35 millimeters tall, somewhere somewhere in there, that's not exact, and it does vary just a little bit. It is hand forged, it does have some unique character to it. We like to use little skillets like this for heating tortillas when we make tacos, and I'll probably get a chance to try that out in the next day or two. But in the meantime, I hope you can get out to your shop, be safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.